Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, happy Friday. My name is Matangi from University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, and I'm the moderator for this session. Um, today's talk will be our um, final lecture on the KOL CID lecture mini series, Complex Innovative Design mini series. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, our speaker today, my friend, Dr. James Travis. Uh, James has been with the FDA Office of Biostatistics in the Division of Biometrics 2 since 2014, and he currently leads the statistical team supporting uh, the Division of Pediatric and Maternal Health in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. James also uh, works on several activities for the Complex Innovative Design uh, Paired Meeting Program and has a strong interest in Bayesian designs with informative priors. Uh, his talk will be on that topic today. And James received his PhD from University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, so James, it's all yours. Uh, we will have a question and a session at the end of uh, his presentation, but I'll be monitoring the chat. If there are any uh, immediate questions to be asked, I will prompt James. Yeah, thank you, everyone. James, it's all yours now. Thank you, Mafangi. So um, today I'm going to be speaking on considerations of Bayesian methods with informative priors. It's one of the central issues well, one of the recurring issues that we, we see with um, CID uh, programs is um, how, how do we deal with, with these um, informative priors where we have, quote unquote, usually a um, type one error inflation problem. Uh, so some, so I'm going to discuss some of the, some of my perspective and, and views on those issues. Um, so uh, just a disclaimer, these are my views and not FDA's views or policies. Uh, so before I dive into the presentation in general, I thought it would be good to um, have a quick uh, overview of some of the um, changes in, in uh, to the CID program with um, PDUFA 7. So um, the uh, CID program was started under PDUFA 6, and uh, it is being continued under uh, PDUFA 7. Uh, and the objectives are, uh, the primary objectives are, are similar, where uh, we have the continued intent to uh, develop staff capacity. Uh, the paired meeting program continues. And uh, there's a couple of additional um, objectives that have been added since the uh, in, uh, new to Padufa 7. Uh, so there is a new um, agreement to uh, convene a public workshop on complex and uh, innovative trial designs and also to publish a uh, draft guidance on um, Bayesian methods. Um, so as I mentioned, um, so FDA is continuing under uh, has agreed to continue under PDUFA 7 to continue uh, to develop staff capacity and uh, engage with external experts for complex and innovative trial designs. Uh, the CID paired meeting program continues as announced in the Federal Register and uh, it will continue to select up to uh, eight proposals per year with the requirement that the, uh, there is this information disclosure, which again continues. Um, so the new uh, commitments under PDUFA 7 are to convene a public workshop. Uh, so the public workshop is intended to uh, study four, four, four different topics. So considerations for external data sources, Bayesian statistical methods, simulations, clinical trial implementation, and uh, there is the requirement to publish, uh, the, is the agreement to publish a draft guidance on the use of Bayesian methodology in clinical trials of drugs and biologics. So as the, uh, I think only FDA speaker in this series, I thought it was important to to just share these. Uh, so the website is still um, up and available. And it has uh, many of the excellent um, resources, uh, uh, giving an overview of um, things that have been accomplished so far in the program. Um, so there is a, a paper published in two, uh, 2021 uh, by uh, Dr. Dion Price and John Scott, 
uh, discussing um, the summary of the program as of that date. Um, so that gives an overview of um, the FDA perspective on uh, some of the programs that have come through the CID program. Uh, there's some write-ups of, of uh, case studies. Um, so free write-ups so far are master protocols, lupus, and DLBCL uh, that are available. Um, and since then as well, uh, some uh, Ionian, uh, Alexi Ionian uh, led development of a paper on uh, to give an overview of um, Bayesian methods in um, drug product and um, biological product development. So that gives also a wider perspective on some of the C some of the Bayesian and uh, designs that have been seen. Uh, and there was also a workshop back in um, was it fall twenty twenty one discussing um, the development of. Um, pediatric therapeutics using complex innovative trial designs. Uh, so these are some of the recent activities we've had through the CID program. So with, with that uh, said, uh, this is an overview of the rest of my presentation. So I'm gonna have uh, just a brief discussion on decision rules. Uh, and then I'm going to dive into the, the um, discussion on informative priors, have a brief discussion on dynamic versus static priors, um, considerations for adaptive trials with informative priors, some considerations on simulations, and finally, some discussion of sensitivity analyses. So I think uh, it's useful to just uh, say um, a little bit about decision rules. Um, so um, when designing uh, Bayesian trials, it's helpful to consider them, to consider what are, what are our decision rules. And I think most of the discussion has centered around kind of this, this typical type of format. Uh, so I think this is discussed in the CID communications guidance, which is, Provided, which is linked to on the uh, CID website. Um, so we usually have something of the form pro probability that parameter A is bigger than parameter B given data is greater than P0. Um, or probability of um, parameter A minus parameter B is greater than some threshold um, is greater than P0 given our data. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the challenges are, some of the challenges in using informative priors are how we choose P0. And I think there's still a lot of unsettled discussion on, um, how we choose that. And it, it's very circumstantial. Um, but I think that this, this seems to be the direction that things have been trending from what I've seen. So um, I'm going to dive into the discussion of informative priors now. So the area where I'm most familiar and where I think we've seen the most examples um, of informative priors are in pediatrics. So a number of the CID programs have been in pediatrics. Um, and the, there are also other situations where um, it's been considered uh, and um, the, these include borrowing across treatments um, slash diseases when we're in a master protocol setting, as we saw, I think, with one of the previous um, CID presentation, uh, one of the previous presentations in this series, borrowing control information from external data, which was another one that we saw in this series, borrowing across dose groups. Again, <laughs> we've seen that in this series. Uh, so there's a lot of common, a lot of common problems in all of these different settings. Um, and we've seen a lot of different approaches to implementing the, these different, these, uh, this borrowing. Um, so 
Uh, we've seen hierarchical priors. We've seen robust meta-analytic meta priors. We've seen propensity score matched dynamic borrowing. Um, and usually the objective is we have some kind of source data that we want to use to rely on um, to make inferences about some target uh, population. So I think this is the main source, uh, the main way that his, this has been put down in guidance is in the, um, the, the draft ICH E11A guidance, which discusses uh, this issue in terms of pediatrics, but I think there are many consider many considerations that um, are common to whatever setting you're in. So if you're in the if if you're in the setting where you have different diseases within a master protocol, the we have the same type of spectrum where it's where we are looking at. Um, are they different diseases? Are they the same disease? Are there some manifestations that are the same that are somewhere in between? Um, there will be a variety of <laughs> different degrees of evidence to support similarity. Um, the the quote-unquote extrapolation plan will also this type of concept will also be is also I think relevant in other situations beyond the pediatric situations. Um, so um, where we have where we have strong strong levels of confidence that the disease is the same, then that will call into question different methods than being on kind of the left hand side of the spectrum where we need independent, adequate and well controlled clinical trials in each different disease setting. So how how we think about this, I think, is is there's a lot of commonalities across the different areas. The exact considerations and the exact data available will differ, but there are, I think, situations beyond just the pediatric where where this type of concept is is relevant. Now when we're in this this type of situation and we are explicitly using external information um then this is again i think a quote from ICHE 11a um so when we have external inf information that's explicitly being borrowed we need to think about the rationale for the borrowing and the explanation of how the prior uh, distributions were constructed um but then there is always the there's always an internal discussion on is a particular prior reasonable how do we uh, how do we assess whether a particular prior is reasonable how do we answer that question and i think that there's a, there's been quite a lot of discussion a lot of discussion in different areas perhaps than just in drug and biologic development that we have to that we can um look at and uh, borrow from so, for example, in the device world, uh, where there's a lot more experience, I think, with Bayesian um, clinical trials. Um, so this is taken from uh, uh, the paper, this paper by um, Jean Pinello and Laura Thompson. Um, how do we measure the impact of the borrowing? I think that is one definite way to uh, that we have one definite thing that we have to do when considering is a prior reasonable. How much does it borrow is, I think, one of the first questions that comes to everyone's lips. Um, so um, Pinello and Thompson discussed several different ways of looking at the impact of the borrowing. Um, so we have, we can look at what it says about the outcome at hand. So we can look at, say, the prior probability of efficacy, and that would be one me one method of measuring. We can look at the impact on the oper operating characteristics, such as the chance of erroneous conclusion, the type one, uh, basically the type one error, or the power. Uh, we can look at how much information it contributes using measures such as the effective sample size. 
Uh, so all of these are important exercises that I think it's important to assess in any, any particular setting. I think different people have different um, experiences, different knowledge base, and I think it's difficult to necessarily say that one size fits all in every situation. I think certain methods are maybe more comfortable to different audiences than others. And so I think it's important to consider all of them in, in how we consider the impact of borrowing. Um, so the prior probability of a claim is, is fairly uh, straightforward to assess. So given a particular prior, we can just assess what is the probability that a, a particular parameter is, say, greater than uh, the uh, different parameters, so whether the treatment effect is greater than pl the placebo effect, given our prior information uh, using either one of these two formulations. Um, so we can use this to calibrate to calibrate a prior to make sure it's consistent with uh, stakeholders' beliefs. And I think this, this lends itself probably more easily to using some of the formal elicit elicitation processes. Um, such as those discussed by um, O'Hagan et al. in, uh, in um, the uh, book Concerned Judgments. Um, those are definitely, I think, one thing we one thing to consider. Um, so chances of erroneous conclusions are something else that tends to get considered and thrown around a lot in these types of situations. Um, so it's very easy to compare to uh, our typical typical values. We have we have looked at it, well. A lot of the time, we look at one sided two point five or two sided five percent. Uh, so we can look at how the chance of erroneous c conclusions is calibrate calibrated relative to that. Um, but there are challenging questions that occur um, when using that. So how much inf inf uh, inflation is reasonable in a situation? It, it like a lot of the a lot of the conversations will boil down to well, is ten percent too big? Is fifteen percent too big? Um, it, it's a, a challenging question to answer. Like how how much more <laughs> how much greater chance of erroneous conclusion should should we consider in a regulatory setting? Um, there are also issues with it with this question being meaning with the chance of erroneous uh, conclusion being meaningful in a particular situation. So if we're in the case where we have um, we're extrapolating from uh, adults to pediatrics. Are we in the situation where the null hypothesis is um, a reasonable belief? There, are, there are, can be many cases where, like, we have a lot of um, previous pediatric development programs um, that have been considered. Um, there are drugs that have been shown to be effective in both adults and, and pediatrics. So uh, how salient is kind of the, the null scenario, the no treatment effect scenario in a particular situation will vary. Um, so um, if we know, if we have a high degree of confidence in the disease process and mechanism being similar in children, um then the then it's much more unlikely that we believe the drug has no effect in children so how how do we take that into consideration when when um designing our programs and agreeing to particular prior distributions so the final consideration is effective sample size uh so the simplest way to calculate it is to just look at the variance ratio. So if we look at the variance ratio with the prior information ignored, divided by the variance with the prior information utilized, and multiply that by our sample size, uh, that gives us um, a, fair, a, a crude measure of the effective sample size of a, a particular prior distribution. Um, so this has been generalized um, to a wider variety of scenarios 
by Marita Farmola. Um, so if we have a particular prior given some historical information, uh, we want to look at the, uh, and we have some kind of a vague prior, uh, we update that with sample size M uh, and that gives us a posterior. So if we, if we find the M that minimizes the distance between our, the particular prior that we're, we're selecting and our vague prior with um, M patients with information, the uh, M which minimizes that is can be thought of as an effective sample size. Um, so in, in um, uh, if you have a normal distribution, say, it reduces to the previous um, finding. So we have um, normal distribution with known variance sigma squared, prior variance uh, sigma tilde squared. Um, then we know that the um, Fisher information of the normal distribution is one over the variance. So we plug in uh, one over the prior variance minus M over our um, known variance. And that gives that reduces to sigma squared over sigma tilde, tilde squared. So the the variance um, the variance associated with one patient um, compared to uh, divided by the the prior information. Um, so it gets a bit more difficult when we have dynamic uh, when we have dynamic priors. Um, so in this case, we're choosing a particular sigma bar, uh, sig uh, theta bar, uh, where we're assessing the distance. So in the normal distribution. Um, the Fisher information doesn't depend on the location. Uh, so in the simple situation, it's going to, it's going to be, the, the effective sample size is gonna be location invariant. It doesn't matter what, where we're assessing um, this quantity, it's always gonna be the same, give us the same thing, the same answer. But when we have dynamic priors, it gets a bit more challenging. And this is partially because they adapt the level of uh, borrowing to um, some measure of similarity between the source and the target data. So if we have commensurate priors, if we have mixture priors, elastic priors, hierarchical models, they uh, adapt the degree of borrowing uh, depending on different factors. So for commensurate priors, it's based on uh, the proximity of the mean, uh, similar for mixture prior, well, mixture priors is slightly more complicated, um, hierarchical priors, yeah. Um, so the advantages of considering dynamic priors are that they provide better operating characteristics typically re re relative to, stat to a static prior, um, where we use a constant amount of information. Um, so our, our bias, our um, MSE, uh, our chance of erroneous conclusions uh, can be improved. Um, but there's a lot more decisions that need to be made in, in uh, assessing these priors. Um, and that makes quantifying the degree of um, prior borrowing uh, a more challenging issue. So here, here we have a very simple example. So if we have, say, a single arm trial, um, if we have a simple informative prior, so just like a single normal distribution uh, versus a mixture prior, we see that the mixture prior does invariably better um, than the simple prior in terms of the bias. Um, so when we have when we have a true mean that's fairly close to the um, prior mean, um, so the, there's basically no difference in the in the bias. But as as we go further and further away from the mean, as our true mean gets further and way further away from the prior mean, so we see here, say, when we have a true mean of three relative to our prior mean of 0.5, 
um, the the magnitude of the bias is much much smaller for the um, mixture prior compared to the simple prior. Likewise, for the mean square error, uh, we see that when we're relatively close to the true mean value. Uh, relative to the uninformative prior root mean square error, so this black line here, um, we have an improvement for both methods. But as we get further away from um, our, our prior mean value, uh, the size of the mean square error keeps going up for the uh, simple prior, whereas for the mixture prior, it reaches some kind of maximum and then starts to drop back down and then becomes basically the, the same as the uh, uninformative prior root mean square error. So the, there's a there's an area where both will do worse than in terms of the mean square error compared to the uninformative method, but there is an improvement when we're in this zone, um, but the, the mixture prior will uniformly do better than the, uh, the simple prior. So if we look at the uh, simple simple variance ratio um, for the um, um, effective sample size uh, for the mixture prior, we can see that when we have a true mean value close to our prior mean value, we're borrowing about the same amount of information, but then it, it drops off as, we're, as we move further away. So eventually, there is kind of a, a negative effective sample size where doing the Bayesian method will result in uh, a, a basically um, a, an increase in the in the variance, a decrease in the precision of the estimates, um, and that's captured in the effective sample size. Uh, so we have a precision loss versus precision gain when we're when we're far enough away from the true mean value. Um, but this doesn't take into account the bias <laughs> or the mean square error where uh, we, we see that that much worse um, performance. So there's there's a lot of different trade-offs that ha have to be made and that that th this is where it makes um, assessing the reasonableness of a prior even more challenging. Um, so there's been some proposed some proposed updates to effective sample size methods such as the expected local information ratio so as we saw with the marita far muller that is we're taking a particular parameter value r theta bar um, and when we do these types of dynamic uh, dynamic methods uh, it depends on theta theta bar. So rather than taking a, a single particular value, one proposal is to integrate or take the expected value over um, the plausible values of theta. So uh, this is um, discussed in um, this predictively consistent prior effective sample size paper. And then there's an implementation <clears throat> of the assessment in a range of scenarios with the uh, our best uh, packages. Um, so I think that that's the main things I have to say about effective sample size. So for so the the next topic I'm going to discuss is adaptive trials and informative priors. Um, so a lot of uh, in quite a number of the ca of cases in the CID program we saw people wanted to combine adaptive trials with informative priors. So it provides a lot of different interesting approaches. Um, so there's an excellent paper by my former FDA colleague, Jing Jing Yi, um, looking at um, skeptical versus um, a skeptical prior to control the chance of erroneous conclusion. So that that's obviously an additional method that we don't have uh, that doesn't, uh, that we don't have in say frequentist analysis world, um, which can provide inter uh, provide interesting uh, approaches to control say the the chance of erroneous conclusion. Um, but again, this make this makes things more challenging to assess overall. 
Um, so when we combine the two challenges, adaptive and informative priors, the calibration and operating characteristic uh, questions become much more complicated and much more time consuming to assess. And there are also additional philosoph philosophical challenges that occur. So if we're in a situation where we are borrowing information and in, a, in, and in an adaptive setting, how do we decide a particular decision threshold? So deciding a, de a decision threshold with an informative prior in the without an adaptive <laughs> setting is a is a interesting question. But then you ha then we have to add in the the question of, well, um, now we're um, now we're varying the amount of information, but then we're also adding in different looks and the number of different looks and the timing of the looks can can inflate the chance of erroneous conclusion. Um, so um, how do we maintain re regulatory consistency fr throughout the different programs um, that are seeking a particular indication? So if we have, say, an adaptive trial with just a final landmark analysis at the completion of the trial, um, and we have a second program that uses an adaptive design with multiple interim efficacy analyses. How do we make sure that we ensure um, fairness and consistency between the programs? And I, I think that that's still a challenging topic uh, from a regulatory perspective. Um, so next topic is simulations. Um, so I think everything I'm going to say here is probably going to come by, apply to basically any uh, uh, complex design. Um, so they're just necessary to understand the operating characteristics. Um, and these have tended to be the um, operating characteristics that we, we've looked at. So the power, chance of erroneous conclusions, the bias, the variance of the estimator, and hence the uh, mean square error, the effective sample size. So all of these are important in informing our thinking about how to um, make decisions about particular price. Um, but I think the best practices are remembering that the key issue is communication. Um, so there can be there can be cases where there's simulations and we have to spend a lot of time reading to try to understand them. Um, and the, uh, I think improvements that can be made in terms of readability and transparency. <clears throat> and it's very good to concentrate on these these types of issues to make sure that um, we the inf the key information is available to regulators when we're re when we're reviewing these because they are uh, CID applications are I think pretty much the most time consuming <laughs> type of I investigative new drug applications that we look at they they take significantly more time than a than uh, your typical type of IND, and it takes a lot more effort to to try to understand the the different scenarios, the assumptions, to try to find and just cross reference all of the different information, and um, I think making sure that those are as readable and as user friendly as possible for for regulators is is very much appreciated. <laughs> Um, so finally, I just wanted to say a few words about sensitivity analyses. So I think they are, they sometimes feel almost like an afterthought in, in some of the programs. It's like, well, we've come up with all the, um, primary analyses and now FDA is asking us to do sensitivity analyses. Um, but I think that they're, they're 
100% crucial in, in these types of scenarios. And I think thinking about how thinking about the factors that are important to um, take into account and how we assess them is probably in its infancy right now. Um, in general, I've seen, uh, to me at least, they seem at least as important as any sensitivity analysis for missing data, if not more important because we have this, this information that's being borrowed. And we have to assess whether the prior information is consistent with the current information <clears throat> and how we do that and how we how we uh, take that into account in our assessments is, is crucial. So here is an example from a, a, a recent advisory committee um, from um, last year where we had uh, where we were looking at pediatric asthma. Uh, so we had, say, lack of consistency between the pediatric age group and the adult age group. So here, if we look at uh, this high dose um, in the adolescents and the uh, lower dose in, in the younger children, the... the um, effect estimate is on the... <laughs> Uh, other side of the of, of unity for the hazard ratio. So there is uh, we have favors the uh, on the left hand side um, of the of the um, forest plot uh, th that favors the experimental treatment. On the right hand side, that fa favors the reference treatment. So when we were so when we have this inconsistent information, how do we take it, take this into account when doing our sensitivity analyses where we have basically very, very small sample sizes? We had, uh, I think about 30, 30 events per arm in adolescents compared to close to a thousand events per arm in adults. Um, so there was, a, I think there was a lot of considerations for that would uh, that could have been considered beforehand for um, sensitivity analyses in the situation that I think we just need to think a lot more about and have more discussions about and have more interactions about. Um, I think there's a lot more attention that needs to be paid into how we present this information, how we how we um, draw conclusions, how we, how we utilize things. Um, so I think in summary, um, the CID program has been very helpful in, in driving discussion and acceptance of these innovative trials. I think if we hadn't had the CID program, then we may, <laughs> we would probably be a lot further behind on, um, well, we may not have had the uh, the venue and the opportunity to have a lot of these discussions uh, or, or as much of the incentive. Um, but I think there's still a lot more work to be done on determining the degree of borrowing and determine, determining the calibration of priors and these conversations are still um, very challenging to have and they, they take a lot of um, back and forth <laughs> um, internally and externally to, to really uh, address and to um, come to uh, agreement on in the cases where we have been able to reach agreement. So thank you for your for your time and your attention and for the invitation to speak. Yeah, thank you, James, um, for a very interesting talk. Um, the floor is open for questions. Um, to ask a question, please use the chat or uh, you can unmute yourself uh, and speak. Well, I already see a question on chat. Are you able to look at it, James? Thank you. Yes, I have the, the chat up. 
Let me just move it so I'm not looking over there. Um, so with such a wide confidence interval, can one really conclude that the treatment defect would differ by age subgroups to the to the best? It might be hypothesized, hypothesis generating with such a small sample size. And I think, yes, that, that I think was um, a key feature of the advisory committee discussion uh, in that case. Do we have the information necessary to make a decision in this case? Or do we need more information? Hey there, James. This is Andrew Hartley from Thermo Fisher Scientific. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, okay, great. So I um, wanted to go back for a second to the idea of consistency and fairness. You had uh, one slide that talked about that. I didn't catch the number of the slide, but uh, does uh, regulators uh, really have a definition of fairness and consistency that they always use. Um, and uh, to try to illustrate the um, meaning of my question here, uh, I'm thinking of one sponsor that uses Fisher Exact Test versus another which uses maybe um, a uh, chi-square test in the frequentist world, okay? So uh, we all know that Fisher exact test is more conservative. Um, it doesn't reject as highly as often. And it's um, it's uh, listed type one error rate is actually below uh, 0 0.05, even though you might be shooting for 0 0.05. So um, how, how do we address fairness and consistency in that kind of a situation? Um, do, do we... Uh, just say that one analysis is wrong because it's over overly conservative, or do we try to uh, adjust that in our mind somehow? Um, does the regulator perform an additional analysis to put those on a level playing field? Uh, how does that really work? And is there an analog in all this to uh, to judging fairness and equality in um, in a Bayesian setting? Um. I don't know of any particular definition from a regulatory sense. I, uh, I, I, I don't know if anything has been codified in, in a. I don't know of anything that's been codified mm -hmm. in a particular guidance. I think in in the situation, it's like it. The sponsor has the opportunity to choose whichever test they want. So it's like if they want to go with a more conservative test. <laughs> they have the opportunity to choose that uh the say the chi-square test versus the fisher exact test and i i think that there are certain analogies that can be made in the bayesian setting as well it's like well if the spun for the sponsor who's doing a single who's doing a single test without interim analyses um they have the opportunity to provided the information the the information about the first has been public made public to use that same testing structure um and be be consistent with that i think it it, it there can be issues where we, we are having these additional issues where we are having these uh, discussions in a in kind of a non-public setting as well, where where the onus is kind of on us as us as regulators to make sure we're being consistent with with the standards. I think where it's public and where the the standards are being discussed and available for reference, um, then yeah, I I I think that. We could probably spend much more time discussing the, this very question just by itself. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it's, I don't have a definitive, a definitive answer. And I think it, it's something that, that we need to consider as regulators, particularly where we're getting into the, these more complex settings where consistency is even more of an issue compared to that frequentist setting where it's like test a versus test b <laughs> yeah yeah 
Uh, well, where I could see the issue coming up for a Bayesian analysis is as time goes on, um, we have more and more information and uh, about biological mechanisms of action, for instance, or um, prior studies from which to borrow information. So that could provide an advantage to sponsors developing the same or similar drugs later. And uh, does that put them on an unfair uh, playing field where, where they have um, an undue advantage? That is a very challenging question. And uh, yeah, we, we've, I've certainly had discussions with people about that. And I, I think to an extent in pediatrics, at least, there is the incentive to want to try to minimize the number of pediatric patients who we um, expose to an experiment, experimental um, um, therapy because they are not able to consult in the same way as, as adults. I think in adults, it's maybe a, a slightly different consideration. I think in pediatrics, maybe the argument is is stronger for incorporating that that prior information but i think that there's definitely um discussions to be had on, on that question yeah, okay thank you any other questions yeah there is one on chat james uh, so does your plot of effective sample size comparing simple versus mixture prior imply that mixture prior can address prior data conflict, meaning ESS under mixture prior is lower when the likelihood is far away from the prior? So yes, it it, it impl implies exactly that. So um, these methods can reduce um, prior prior data conflict where you where you are as you get further away. The the issue tends to be how aggressive are you in tuning that behavior? So you you could be very, very aggressive and, and have kind of um, some kind of kernel function that says that when I have um, like a, when my observed data mean is zero, <laughs> It has no effect that I don't want to borrow inf any information. Um, I that that I think is where some of the challenge, where added challenge um, occurs for the for the mixture prior model. It, it's that how aggressive are you with the tuning? Um, given that, like the uh, when you are when you are super aggressive, you're going to ha have that much lower window of benefit. Um, versus um, having a wider win window where the, the, the you will have some uh, greater benefit for borrowing, where you have more improved precision in your estimators, um, lower mean square error. But um, yeah, it it can address it to some degree, but it is a complex issue, and uh, it it's not just saying. Um, well, I can tune away all of the uh, the type one error, um, but that has downstream effects on the efficiency of your estimator. Does that answer your question? Great. Any other questions? Yes, this is John Lowy. Um, my question has to do with when you're setting up these experiments, the idea of equivalence between uh, two tested uh, gr groups. And I think that the, the range of that equivalence is important uh, as a starting point as well when you're considering the design of that particular clinical trial. How much do you put into that aspect for the design? By equivalence, you would mean say- Not uh, necessarily bioequivalence, but just if you, the treatment effect. We, 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 we have a lot about talking about prior distributions and assumptions 
but we don't really talk about what do we think is really deemed equivalent uh, when you're going to have a finding at the end of the day. How much of a difference is really considered to be uh, the same? And well, I think it's the same versus is the effect meaningful in right. in the target population? Um, and I I I think. Um, it's yeah, it's a challenge, challenging issue. I think that the a priori we want to try to assess what is the available evidence to kind of support the, uh, as we would say, using technical terminology, usually exchangeability or something like that um, between the groups. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for your question. No, it's it's okay. It's just I think this is the next uh, era for which, when we're starting out, we've got to say where it's not just that we're looking for a difference with the power. It's really about how are we starting out and what are we deeming as a society to say we need. This is what we're deeming as equivalent as this as the starting point when yeah. we're testing the uh, advantages of a new proposed treatment. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thanks for your question. So this is Tom Lewis. Maybe I'll make one comment on that, having nothing specifically to do with adaptive priors or anything. But for me, the Bayesian formulation helps with that in that the discussion is about what are the true underlying differences and what size of that is important to bring to clinical practice as opposed to what estimates are close to each other. And so for me, it doesn't make the conversation any easier, but it makes it more focused. Thank you for that remark. not seeing anybody unmuting themselves so just um, maybe one naive question this is ram from emd sorona uh, the mixture priors does it matter the amount of mixtures you have uh, 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 is it two mixtures versus three mixtures would it in, would it affect the calculations you you are doing for the effective sample size uh, sure. Uh, I don't think it makes too much. I think the the, the theory the theory doesn't depend on the number of mixtures. Um, so if you look at there's a very nice paper on Bayes, uh, uh was it called tutorial for Bayesian model averaging from uh, I forget the authors, uh, but yeah, basically the number of um, mixtures doesn't make a whole lot of difference in terms of the um, practical issues, you can uh, you can specify kind of an arbitrary number of mixtures. And in some cases, uh, you'll you'll see multiple mixtures. If, if you're doing some kind of a Bayesian meta-analysis, some kind of a meta-analysis, you may see multiple mixtures are better for capturing, say, the heavy-tailed um, distribution that results from the meta-analysis compared to, say, a single component. Um, so if you look at, say, the, uh, what's it, the Neunenschwander robust meta-analytic meta priors. Uh, so one of the things they discuss is having, uh, from the meta-analytic part of the, the, um, distribution, you can take, say, an, uh, any kind of arbitrary number of priors to, to produce like a better, uh, fit of the heavy tail phenomena that result from the meta-analysis. Um, but yeah, generally, I think it depends on the sources of information that you have. Usually we see adult information and then we have our robust robust component to, and we're looking at averaging, uh, some kind of averaging between those two models that um, produces um a, a prior that is kind of a comp a posterior that's a compromise between the two situations um 
but you, yeah, you can uh, but you can generally, I think, um, introduce as many components as you would like. Um, I think if you had say prior adult data, prior pediatric data, um, but the the, the uh, issue is that you're it, the it's a compromise between them versus say augmenting the adult prior with the pediatric like the prior pediatric information from elsewhere that you might have um so competing information sources versus cooperating information sources is is i think the consideration there thank you All right. I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, in that case, um, thank you, James, uh, for an uh, interesting talk and also engaging with the patiently with the questions. Um, thank you all for joining the session today and, um, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.